by the stroke of the pen, the governor is able to make significant strides in movement. And, and one of the things about a governor making this decision is in states like California, where there is no legislative body review of the governmental executive order, it means he can move forward day one and put some things in place. And so aside from the, the, the big date of 2035, there are some dates that are coming up in the near term that are significant for this process to work. And I think that this piece is how I see that road map or that pathway to autonomous vehicles. So what will happen in California is, aside from this executive order mandating the 2035 date and the 2045 date for all vehicles, the governor has also mandated that their Air Resources Board begin to lay down a strategy and a development for their infrastructure in transportation to also be compliant. The, the development and strategy has steps by, by which they have to provide the public notification of where they are and what they're doing. And that first date is January 31st, 2021. So not very long from now, we'll have that framework of what the state believes, the state's board that is, that is charged with meeting this deadline, deadline, what they believe they need to do in order to be successful. And I think if we look at even the AV situation, because I'm always tackling these, you know, one, two, from an AV standpoint, if we had um, legislation, sort of that executive order with the pen decision at the federal government that tasks a executive branch of government with coming up with a true development plan, with coming up with a true strategy of how to get this done on, an, on a national basis with specific timelines and deadlines in place, then we would have a framework within which to work from. So what happens is, you know, the governor of California says, we're all gonna do this, right? So what about the things in California that could be a barrier and what are the benefits? We know that there are issues of equity um, time and time again, we see in, in communities across America where especially the low income urban communities, um, you know, the, the air quality is so poor that the belief is with electrification and, and EVs that you're removing these toxins from the environment, especially in these communities. But it does require you to build out a sizable infrastructure in order to address whether or not there is enough power to have electric vehicles on widespread use uh, throughout the state and then eventually throughout the nation. Um, we also can say one of the wonderful benefits is you will be impacting jobs and growth in high quality jobs throughout the state of California. As it is, California has, has seemed to be sort of the Mecca in the United States um, probably outside of, of Pittsburgh's activities, but where EV and AV companies have decided they want to call home because the state is so friendly and frankly, so innovative in assisting this technology to flourish. So it's just going to bring more, um, more jobs to California and frankly, more high quality jobs to California. Um, infrastructure has to be built out. They don't have it now. If we flipped a switch and we woke up and it was 2035 and please God let 2020 be over soon, um, we would not have the, 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 the grid right now that could handle that. Where you could say 75% of the population has easy access to um, an 80% charge in 30 minutes or so, so that they could be mobile and go where they need to go. That just doesn't exist. And certainly in, again, low income neighbors, neighborhoods and communities where your drivers might live, right? So we, we still live in a society where we're not quite AV taking us everywhere. We have these uh, TNCs 
they live in communities that might not have the infrastructure to support the charging of those vehicles. That has to be addressed in very short order. And, and not the least of which we need to address is the current administration. I think that we will have a real understanding of pathway forward um, once we know who's won the 2020 presidential election. And I say that not because I'm picking sides, so to speak, but the Trump administration has already pushed back at current executive orders that exist in California with respect to emissions and vehicle standards. And NHTSA and the Department of Transportation have promulgated new rules and regulations and in fact have withdrawn waivers and preemption, excuse me, waivers and exemptions that California already had in existence. So those are um, churning through the court system. California shall will be a significant decision if we get there. Um, if we have a new administration, the likelihood is that um, those new rules would be rescinded and we would continue with some of the um, previous administration's viewpoints and guidelines when it comes to electric vehicles and building out an infrastructure across the US. Um, I can kind of go on and on, but I think that this is a really good point for us to get into a, a real dialogue um, collectively. Nobody is a, um, is a know-it-all on this subject. We all have our piece to play. Um, and I think that we need to make sure that we're listening to all people who are interested and want to be a part of this innovation and this transformative technology. One of the things that I, I just want to leave people with is um, my concern always that community, public engagement is up front. We often wait, especially those of us who are in planning communities and transportation communities, we think we know what the problem is and we're gonna aha solve it. And then we're gonna go into the community and tell them how we've solved it. And yet we're not thinking about the entirety of ways that, that these issues um, affect their lives. It is not that simple. Um, so public engagement, I, I, I believe is, is key, especially in the planning phase. Um, the other thing is, um, Government is not necessarily your friend, but it is not always your foe. Um, having communication and dialogue with government agencies early on, unless you want to do like California did in this instance and sort of, you know, throw the grenade in the room and then run out and see what happens, um, you're going to have to you're going to have to be able to communicate and try to resolve these issues. What will eventually happen is that you know, executive order N7920 will wind up in the courts. Somebody's gonna push back on it. Somebody, some interested party stakeholder group, if not the federal government themselves will push back on it. But in the meantime, we will have a strategy and a development plan that can be replicated across other innovations and technologies in the transportation industry. And I think it can serve as a roadmap not just for the other states, but for the federal government uh, in general. So Kevin, I'll toss it back to you. All right, thank you very much, Salika. Um, I would give you claps if I wasn't holding my phone in my hand. <laughs> um, let me pull up uh, some questions I had to get started. Might need to close the video. Thank you, Greg. I, I see Professor Alan Kornhauser in the room. And uh, if you wanna talk about somebody who's uh, who knows it all in this industry, he's probably one of the first people that uh, that we should be calling on and asking his opinion and his thoughts on this industry because he has probably seen it all. Oh, Good yeah, afternoon, uh, Professor. Thank you for coming, Professor Kornhauser. Uh, first question I was going to lead off on, and you started to touch on it on the begin at the at the end there, was on the pushback. Um, since some of us here aren't lawyers or, or policy experts, um, can you talk about the significance of this as a significant as a an executive order uh, versus something like a decision from a state congress, um, and what might this future pushback on this executive order look like? What might that entail? Well, listen. Um, if we have legislation and your legislative local body has 
vetted, been lobbied, heard from the interested parties and stakeholder groups, and then they pass a law, um, you know, you get the, the opportunity to say it's the will of the people. It doesn't mean you won't wind up in court over that. Um, the executive order is certainly much more likely to end up in court when it is the single decision of, um, of your governing executive in your state. Um, in this case, what we have here is um, California had been addressing issues of air quality and emissions before the EPA was even in existence. And so um, California's, um, essentially their, their air resources board, the, the preliminary board, um, had promulgated their own rules. And that's how California was existing. And um, I think it was about 1967. And the EPA came around in 1970. Um, and the EPA said, well, we're the, we're the federal government now. We'll take it from here. We know how things should be done. And they have their own set of rules and principles and regulations by which um, the states are supposed to abide by. And MITS is the governing body for vehicle standards. And they have their own regulations by which vehicle manufacturers are supposed to operate under. And they're the federal government. But, but California's rules and regulations are stricter, right? So generally, you can't be more lenient than the federal government. And generally, in principle, you can be stricter from a legal standpoint. But here, because of the specific authority by NHTSA and the specific authority for EPA, the federal government had argued California is, does not have the standing to make these stricter or more stringent rules when it comes to emissions and vehicles. And they have tossed and tug of war and, and been back in court many times. And California and the EPA have time and time again decided we're going to let California do their thing. Um, but we have a federal government today, a, a, an administration today, where the President of the United States and his administration do not support the more strict standards. They think it's unfair for the, um, the vehicle manufacturing industry. I don't know if the industry agrees so much because they're making more and more cars that are EVs, right? But that's what the federal government has said. And they have created their own set of rules and principles around this very issue and have removed the waivers and the exemptions that had, in, had been previously issued to California and said, no, 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 now you got to abide by our rules. And California is suing, I want to say the federal government, they're suing the, the Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao. And they want, they're saying that the federal government does not have the, the authorization to um, withdraw the waiver and exemptions that had previously been provided to the state of California and these accompanying 12 states and the District of Columbia who have uh, signed on to this emissions standard. So that's really the difference between having an executive order and, and having a legislative body. I think you'd be in court anyway. And, um, and it remains to be seen who wins next week that may very well say whether or not the, the federal government is gonna continue this fight, so to speak, or if the federal government says, you know, we support the position that California is taking and we, we don't mind the stricter or more stringent standards in California and guys have at it and let's see where it goes because if we can get this done, we can get AVs done as well. Thanks. Um, I think now would be a good time to turn it over to, to audience questions. I know I have more questions if no one else does. I'd love to turn it over to the audience. I mean, I, I have, have Andrew raising his hand. Let me see. If, Go ahead, um, Andrew. And then I, will, I have a question about EVs and AVs. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for your, your presentation and information you presented. It was great. A uh, question for you, and that is uh, when it comes to connected cars and um, the autonomous vehicles, because we're, as you, I love the way you said it, moving from EV to uh, AV. Um, how do you see uh, the security of the information that not just the, the new cars that still have ice in them, but also the ones that will be EVs, um, integrating with the, um, the connected cities and the security that's associated with 
And just to give you a, a kind of a background in that is that I know uh, manufacturers, uh, specifically two German manufacturers that are developing principles for the electric vehicles um, and they're including them on blockchain technologies in, in order to make sure that things are secure. But how does that come down to the legislation, uh, legislative aspects of when cities are starting to figure all of this out and what's going to be secure, what's not going to be secure? So it's just it's a broad question to understand, but I know you can dive into it if you want. <laughs> Listen, I, I think one of my frustrations, um, I know there are those who think if there's no real federal standard, everybody can test and map and do their thing and nobody's impeding innovation. And I've heard that time and time again, but I really don't think that that's the right way to proceed. We're all kind of driving around, so to speak, with blinders on. Security is, is critical. This, this understanding of the safety of the technology is part and parcel of what provides the public sector with comfort for these vehicles to be deployed in any widespread manner. You think what's going to happen is, as the US gnashes their teeth over whether or not they should sign a bill or have a bill, foreign countries are gonna go ahead and develop standards and they're going to put those vehicles on the road and we're gonna be subject to those standards because we haven't stepped up to the plate as we should have in the early days. If I can jump in there, uh, I think that's ex exactly right, uh, Salika. You know, what, what we've really seen in, in the US is uh, this this sort of hesitance to move forward uh, on, on passing AV legislation and, and, and finding ways uh, for to actually work together uh, on on moving forward uh, a standard. And the thing about uh, establish, making sure these these standards are established in the U.S. as well, uh, that's that, that's really important, um, is actually sort of on the accessibility side. You know, the U.S. has a really really strong accessibility um, uh, advocacy community uh, for people with disabilities and for accessibility. And if uh, sta international standards end up being developed by other bodies where perhaps those communities aren't as uh, active or, 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 or as listened to, uh, we might even see a sort of repeat of a lot of the same problems that we've seen previously uh, with the first auto revolution, right? Um, and so I think I agree, the US needs to take a leadership role um, in, in a lot of these. Uh, one little anecdote, uh, if you don't mind me sharing is, um, you know, there, there are international sort of conferences where, uh, where technical leaders and government leaders uh, all come together uh, to sort of to set standards um, and every, every other country than the U.S. will send a lot uh, of technical representatives from their regulatory agencies. The U.S. is lucky if NHTSA sends one or two. Granted, the U.S. doesn't participate as much in sort of international treaties around, you know, uh, vehicle standards, but there's a lot that we could and should be doing. Um, and honestly, number one, uh, NHTSA needs more resources. Um, and I say that as someone who's working in a company that's being regulated by NHTSA, we need that. Um. <laughs> I think that, I, I think you're absolutely right, Greg. And one of the things that I see, and I work for the federal government mm -hmm. is, um, you know, we have an incoming administration, no matter who it is, we need sort of an AV czar, right? It, AV is over, a, a, many mediums in fact affecting many different stakeholder communities. We have it, you know, piecemealed in piece in parts of the Department of Transportation, but not pulled out as a separate entity requiring unique focus and concern. So it's not necessarily that there aren't the bodies in NHTSA to handle it or the resources, but there has to be a commitment to focus on it. There has to be a commitment to saying, this is not something we, we would like to have. This is a necessity for moving our country forward. Other, otherwise, we're going to be left in the dust. On top of it, I don't even see this as a global war. I know people want to say, well, in Asian countries are far ahead of us. This, we are all so incestuous when it comes to vehicle manufacturers and, and where cars are made and what parts are made here and what parts are made in a foreign country, that this is a holistic issue involving all countries. All countries are facing driver shortages when it comes to heavy trucks and the movement of freight. All countries are dealing with a pandemic 
where people are concerned about using public transportation and possibly being infected in these large groups. All countries are facing issues of emissions and toxicity in their climate based on the vehicles that they're using. This is a everybody, all of us are facing issues of equity around transportation. And so we need someone who's gonna stand up and say, this is for all of us. Let me put someone uniquely in charge to address this and then we'll bring in the other stakeholders and most importantly, we'll bring in the public so that they can take this journey with us. So that when we have widespread technology, nobody says, wait a second, where'd that come from? How long have they been working on that? Yeah. I know what's happening because this is my field in my industry, but if I knock on my neighbor's door, they have no idea of the strides that are taking place so far. Sorry, that was my uh, soapbox. I completely agree. Uh, Alan? Uh, <clears throat> Salika, what, what did you just say? Did, did you just say uh, this is a new mode and we need a new modal administration? This isn't like uh, airplanes, FAA, uh, railroads, FRA, um, uh, cars, uh, FHWA. Um, at, le at least if, if we deal with the driverless piece of this, which is to me the, the business about providing mobility and the provision of mobility uh, uh, by, um, by some provider of that mobility, not about us owning one of these things and playing with it irresponsibly as a toy as we've done uh, with our current automobiles, uh, then it, it's really a, a completely different thing that, <clears throat> that, that should have the czar that you just mentioned, as well as the authority to say, uh, we're not gonna do asterisks on old whatever things that we had. This is, this is a new thing, this is it we're going to address these particular issues and and is that the way to, is that what you just said listen don't get me in trouble but yes that is what i said <laughs> I, I think we need i think we need we need focus and attention and what we're getting is the pieces of certain modes of transportation with maybe a body or two bodies looking at it we need someone whose daily focus a group of people with a czar whose daily focus is autonomous vehicles. And, and that's why I say EV is the way to AV because in California, the head honcho essentially said, I, my czar is gonna be the head of the, you know, the California Air Resources uh, Board. And they're gonna focus completely on making this change to electric vehicles. We can do the same thing at the federal government the president of the United States through the stroke of an executive order says, we need someone whose only and sole focus is strategy and development for widespread deployment. If I could uh, maybe add a little bit on, on top of that, you know, I think that one big question is, as well um, is, uh, you know, in the US the past 50 years, we have been uh, really setting uh, vehicle standards um, around one thing, that's protecting people inside of the vehicle, uh, not people outside of the vehicle, right? We don't have pedestrian safety standards, we don't have bicycle safety standards. We, uh, and we're seeing this rapid rise uh, in pedestrian and cyclist deaths. So um, what if it wasn't just that? What if it was uh, sort of a, a whole systems, uh, it, one person is, who's in charge of a whole system sort of approach uh, to increasing safety across the board? Whether it's implementing Vision Zero, whether it's safely implementing uh, autonomous vehicles, I think there's there, there's a really interesting opportunity, um, especially when we look to you know next year uh, is when the next transportation bill needs to be uh, uh, passed. Um, hopefully, uh, we've never passed one on time uh, in uh, in 20 years, uh, but hopefully Congress will next year. Um, but what if that's our opportunity to say, okay, how do we uh, improve safety on the streets? How do we improve livability? How do we actually have a federal strategy for that, for livability, for safety, for environmental uh, advances? And can we make that, you know, a special priority project um, at, at this DOT? I, I think that's, uh, I think there's some awesome stuff uh, that, that could be done. And of course, this is assuming a different outcome in the election, but also uh, this is something that President Trump could do as well. I think that, um... You know, what I found in the 10 years that I was in either state or federal government is that 
federal government is is really not going to be the one who's going to raise their hand and say, pick me, can I have something <laughs> else to do? It's just not how that works, right? Yeah. So what we need is the energy of those stakeholder communities. The, the issues of mobility that Professor Kornhauser mentioned are huge. Greg, you're right. We are so focused on, do we have an airbag? What? How does the bumper react? All these things inside the vehicle, we, we, we're not paying attention to outside the vehicle. We have, you know, bicycle safety month and we drive three bicycles in front of the Department of Transportation and take some pictures. That is not a policy plan. We are falling down on the job as a nation when it comes to what transportation means. It's not, do I get just from point A to point B? It's, can I get to the doctor? It's, do I have accessibility to good food? Is it, where am I gonna work? And how can I get to a good paying job where I can feed my family? Those are the pieces that are missing. You know, when I hear about people complain about um, AVs and this notion that this delivery bot is gonna take jobs, I, I literally, and I, I, I hope that you all will, will take this away from this conversation. Every time I hear that, I want to say shame on the person who is fighting for someone's livelihood to be a delivery person. Why don't we fight that we give you the skills so that you can have a job where you earn a living that will take care of your family as opposed to fighting so you can deliver groceries to the person who is not able to leave their house. We are missing this conversation. We're not talking about the right things. And so I, I hope that if, if I leave you with nothing else, it's let's look at transportation differently. Yeah, do, right, do you mind if I help? No, do you mind if I help on that? Sorry, Kevin, I know, I know you have questions. Um, I'm, I'm just, I, I love this point that you made uh, because, you know, so uh, about five years ago, I was uh, an Uber and Lyft driver. I was kind of doing it full-time career transition. I. I decided to get in transportation uh, because I was lobbying for defense contractors, realized I didn't want to lobby for missiles, um, and really got into it from the perspective of AVs. And so for, for uh, about five, six months, I was driving for Uber and Lyft uh, for about six, you know, six months, 40 hours per week or so and in Washington, D.C. And so many of my trips uh, were for people uh, living in, in a costume neighborhood um, who didn't have access to adequate public transit to go to the grocery store. So many of my trips, uh, and those were 15, $20 rides for people. It's incredible. Um, and, and also people going to work, people taking their kids to school. Uh, at one point I, I drove someone from, from Anacostia to the school uh, up in Northwest. Um, it, it was just incredible. Um, and and when, we're, when we're thinking about jobs too, um, not, not to put a, a neuro advertisement up here, but we recently did a study um, that, um, that, that found that delivery AV is actually gonna create jobs in those local stores. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have an autonomous delivery vehicle, someone has to get your groceries for you. There's so much unpaid personal labor that we're doing every day, uh, getting our groceries, getting uh, other goods, picking up our dry cleaning. Um, imagine, you know, giving that time back uh, to a single mother or someone who's taking care of their elderly parents. Um, there, there's such a huge opportunity here that, you know, I think often we miss, uh, we miss what these real benefits are going to be um, and also where those jobs are going to shift to. Um, it's going to be much better to have people working in the local uh, brick and mortar store or the local grocery store than driving around town. Um, it's going to be better if that delivery is done by an autonomous electric vehicle. Um, I think the answer is pretty simple. Uh <laughs> well, can, I, can I throw two cents in there? And oh. this talk is great. I love it. Uh, I think that's part of where we're missing is we're advertising to the choir where we want the safety for people, which is 100%, I think, right. We need to you know, protect humans, but we can, we're, everyone can benefit from it. And whether it's the side where you think it's too expensive to do this, uh, we can't do all these things. We need to show, sell that side of it on how much money can be made from all of this, on how much money is saved from not having people in the hospital because they got hit by a vehicle or all these other costs that are incurred. And we need to simplify it down to where you can make millions, billions, trillions of dollars off of these industries if we push them forward and have the benefit of the clean air and water that everyone says they want. So that I think that the, there's just a 
there's different marketing techniques to different uh, constituents out there that need to be handled rather than uh, the constantly just the one direction of th this is safe and it needs to be safe for everyone. And that's the only reason we're going about it. No, I think you're absolutely right. It, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned um, being a part of the executive branch is um, when people are, are lobbying to you, we need to remember that um, we have an obligation to the holistic. It can't be that I'm just gonna talk about the things that work for an urban community and hope that that's enough to get my bill through. We need to find out and share with the electorate at large the things that are also good for the rural community. This notion of autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, innovation and technology is good for America. It doesn't make, it's not about the coasts. Um, inland America is facing some of the same issues when it comes to access to food and jobs and, and, and issues of transportation. I mean, the truth of the matter is we wanna talk about transportation desert. Um, I may be able to walk a mile here and get to a, a Metro, but if I'm in the plains of the middle of America, I'm not walking a mile to anything. And so my, my options are even more limited there. This is good for the holistic of America. Back to you, Kevin. <laughs> hey, uh, should we have a, uh, let me, can, if I can just jump in here because, because I Go think- Go ahead, and then a, I think this, we have a question this, from Andrew. This is a really important topic. And, 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 and where I've gotten to on this topic is that, is that we shouldn't be selling this on safety. That's the current mode's problem. The current mode has created um, an, a, 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 a sense around it that, that it has, that allows you to misbehave. And because of that misbehavior has made it inordinately unsafe. If you quit misbehaving, then it's no longer unsafe. Okay, so this isn't the, the, the dealing with, with the safety issue. It's, it's, it's dealing with a whole host of other issues. The bas basic issue that this is dealing with is providing mobility and the opportunity to uh, provide that mobility to essentially everybody and to provide it affordably and to be able to do it at high quality so that in fact it doesn't. That's what it's doing. It's not doing to the safety. I agree. I think safety should be a given. We shouldn't be questioning whether or not it's going to be safe. That the safety is the floor. It's all these other issues. All right. I think Andrew's had his hand raised for a while. I'm not sure if that's still from the first question, or do you have another question, Andrew? And then I think Philip also has a question. Um, it's, uh, it's actually in addition to what uh, the previous two were talking about. And I look at when I was hearing the word safety, I look at it from a technological standpoint. Um, so me being in the automotive industry for about 20 years, I understand that the manufacturers are creating vehicles that will be safe. It doesn't matter whether they're uh, combustion engine vehicles, whether they're uh, uh, EVs or AVs, they're going to create that. However, every single manufacturer in the world is transitioning significantly uh, amount of resources from not just the safety of the vehicles, but they're turning into software companies. And in that, as a result, safety with the transmission of the data over the air, um, the governance of that transmission of data over the air, as these connected vehicles start coming into, uh, onto, uh, into utility is going to be of importance. So it's going to be, I look at safety from the perspective of not necessarily the actual way the car is made, but the data that's going to be associated with it as these cars become connected to the cities. And then the robustness of that, the transparency of that data, the diversity of that data. So to, to extend on that part, when it comes to the diversity of that data, it has to be non-discriminatory, it has to be fair. But at the same time, it's going to have to be transparent enough where, and to use Salika's example of the person who's in the middle of the plains of the United States, they'll have to say, okay, I need to get you know, 100 miles to um, the next city. Well, an autonomous vehicle could easily do that. We'll call it an autonomous Uber. <laughs> could even easily do that. 
but the data that that customer or that particular customer is going to need, such as their digital wallet in order to pay for that transportation, and then everything else associated with that is going to have to be transferred over. Along with that, what about insurance matters? Well, the insurance company doesn't need all of your personal information that's going to be in that connected car. So the user would subsequently have to decide on what information. It would have to be the user's ability, not the manufacturer's choice, but the user's ability to hold on to the data and say, I only want to give this information to Uber or to the insurance company or whatever. So I, I guess I look at a, a safety as a much broader perspective than what it's uh, being somewhat defined here, um, because I look at it from literally a blockchain perspective, or in this case, a distributed ledger perspective. I think those are important issues, Andrew. A couple of things. Um, from the data standpoint, I, I think what will happen here in the US is we will follow the models of what's happened in Europe. They're taking data and the protection and the use of data very seriously. And again, leaps and bounds ahead of what we're doing here in the US. As a, as a product liability defense lawyer, I will tell you that there are things that companies can do and the average citizen can do as we build out these models to say how long data can be held. So you might transfer some data, but it may be held for a particular, particular period of time and then have to be um, purged for the protection of the user. Those things will, will have to come into play, but, but all things in, in terms of payment, um, we pay for other things electronically now. We, we, we've gotten that down. It doesn't mean people don't steal. It doesn't mean that they're not cybersecurity issues that we face. We're even facing them today when it comes to an election. But we've had enough instances of that that we can begin to create a framework of how we want this data to be exchanged, how we want it to be held. Um, I will tell you, having represented vehicle manufacturers in the past, um, there are design and manufacture issues that will affect liability. Will this be an area where we've determined that it is a no fault and there'll be some giant national pool that we'll all pay into and if there's a crash, you'll get paid from that pool rather than to specify fault with a specific manufacturer once we've deemed them acceptable and or safe to be on the roadway. From an insurance standpoint, the same thing should apply. They should want that. And this may be a way where we are turning uh, sort of the dime on how we look at insurance and liability in America. It, it is incredibly expensive. Um, and one of the reasons it is, is because of people um, who were in my, my profession who have figured out that you can make a really successful living doing this. But sometimes we have astronomical um, jury findings that don't even meet with the circumstances, yet heartstrings, punitive determinations all play into these astronomical figures that then in turn drive insurance and drive future liability. That's again why I think you need a czar someone who is addressing all of these issues holistically, because if we don't address liability and insurance, we won't have widespread use. If we don't convince the public of all the benefits that they'll have, we won't have widespread use. If we don't have the federal government um, really having some skin in the game and putting in some regulatory framework, we won't have widespread use. So we really need this holistic view at the direction and determination of the highest office in this land. If we want to make strides in the US early, because if not, we're going to be left behind and we're just going to have to ask overseas what's next and how do we go about doing this? Thanks for the Thank you very much. Um, we have a question, I think, from Philip, and I have one last one. Uh, this went well over the allotted 20, 30 minutes uh, we had envisioned. It's been an uh, amazing dialogue, uh, really interesting. So, uh, Philip, if you have a question, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Salika, for this incredible presentation. And uh, the article you wrote was also very, very well done and very thought provoking, too. And I mean, I could ask you as well a lot of different questions because I think that's the signal of a great speech or when work is become way of a lot of questions to ask as well. Um, so one thing you teased out in your, in your speech about having like the executive order at the national level, like for the president signing executive order related to the AVs. 
you mentioned it would be say off to like a, an agency that would have like deadlines in place things like that uh but then you, you sort of clarify it later on having like a czar which would be more in charge of the holistic view which i think would be good but so if it was sent to like an agency that have to be maybe like NHTSA, right? And the NHTSA, uh, because it was charged of the safety standards, it's notoriously, it takes a long, long period of time to go through and update safety standards, eight years maybe. So I don't know if uh, Greg also could speak on that as well as <laughs> someone who has to deal with that as well. But uh, yeah, so I think that that's something that like for the, the, the federal level, the president for signing executive order there's a lot of issues that need to be teased out as well with uh, with AVs and we, as you mentioned, the liability insurance and stuff like that. Absolutely, yeah. I, I don't think this is the one. Um, I'm not saying they don't have their usefulness, and I'm not saying that um, that they aren't looking at issues of AV because they have um, executives who are working on AV issues. Um, as we know in this industry, things move a lot quicker than NHTSA moves. And NHTSA is a mode within the Department of Transportation. So what happens in, in government, especially in the federal government, by the time all the people in NHTSA sign off on something, then it's got to go to the department level for all those people to sign off on something. And then it's got to go over to you know, the White House for the policy people over there to sign off and, and or agree on it. You know, sometimes a report is written and it comes out of the agency and it could take a year or two for that report to then cycle through all those places before that report even gets sent to, to Congress as a publishable document. We don't have that kind of time in this industry. We, you know, Things are moving far too quickly. And at the same time, we are impeding the innovation by failure to act. So the idea of a czar separate and apart and outside of the Department of Transportation, meaning they don't have to wind their way through all these different layers. They're, they're uh, um, acting under the authority of and addressing these issues in a, in a much quicker time frame. All right. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Salika. Um, we'll, be, we'll hang out for a few more minutes if anyone wants to network, um, hang out. I see we have some uh, old friends here and some fresh faces. So we'd love to uh, uh, get to know you. It looks like we have um, follow up questions. Um, Salika, if you'd like to leave your email, uh, that'd be oh, great. Yes, I'll leave but yeah, and then my last question for you, Slika, is um, what's next? What's next for you? Uh, what are some big things you're working on? Um, I'm going to solve the world's issues now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have a AV forum that I am trying to get underway at American University. It should be November 17th and 18th. Um, we'll be doing a freight panel. We'll do a city-state panel. We'll do a panel with delivery bots, and then we will do a panel with the global head of policy of a, an AV manufacturer. So um, you should start to look for um, notification and publication on, on that upcoming event in November. I, I wanna focus and continue to have the dialogue from a policy point of view. You know, Andrew gets the data side and you know, Professor Kornhauser gets that engineering side and everybody has their, their way that they're addressing it. I'm a policy person. And so I'm looking at this from the legal side and also what I've coined is the political economy of autonomous vehicles. Um, that, that dollar and cents or what is value, because value is not always money, sometimes value is that public engagement and sentiment and how that weighs on the, the policies regulation surrounding autonomous vehicles, both at the local level and at the federal government. And so I'll, I'll continue to work on that and focus in that area. And, um, and probably start advising people um, who are in the industry of, of what I think that they can do for, for best steps forward. So that's what's in it for me. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Salika. Um, we'll uh, push out information about the American University Forum on um, when that's available. If you're not a member of the DC Autonomous Vehicles Association meetup, um, please join. Um, I'll put that information in the in the chat box in a moment. But uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you all for coming. We'll hang out. I uh, would love to get to know you all. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, right, I'm signing off. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Lika. Bye.